Hey everyone welcome back to our channel The Auto Vault. In 1932, while Henry Ford was perfecting his V8, a Finnish inventor created something so bizarre that engineers said it was impossible. A two-stroke V8 that actually worked. This is the story of how one man's crazy idea challenged the biggest automaker in the world. You know, sometimes the best stories in automotive history aren't about the cars that one, but about the ones that dared to be different. And let me tell you, I've been diving deep into automotive history for years now, and this story about a Finnish inventor who decided to take on Ford with what everyone called a weird, engine design is one that's kept me up at night thinking about what could have been. So grab your coffee, settle in, and let me take you back to 1932, a year when the world was still reeling from the Great Depression, and one man in Finland thought he could outsmart Henry Ford himself. The year is 1932, and if you know anything about automotive history, you know this was the year Ford dropped a bombshell on the industry. The Ford Flathead V8 had just hit the market, and it was revolutionary. For the first time, average Americans could buy a car with a smooth, powerful V8 engine without mortgaging their house. Ford was riding high, and the Flathead V8 was the talk of every garage, every mechanic's shop, and every racing circuit from Detroit to Lowe's Angels. But halfway across the world in Finland, a country most Americans probably couldn't even find on a map back then, there was this inventor who looked at Ford's triumph and thought, I can do better. His name was Ilmari Ranto, and before we get into the absolutely wild engineering of his two-stroke V8, we need to understand who this guy was. Ranto wasn't some backyard tinkerer with more enthusiasm than skill. No, this man was a legitimate engineer who had already made a name for himself in Finland. He had worked on aircraft engines, industrial equipment, and had a particular fascination with two-stroke engines. Now, if you're not super familiar with engine terminology, don't worry because I'm going to break this down in a way that'll make sense whether you're a gearhead or someone who just likes a good underdog story. Let me explain the fundamental difference between a two-stroke and a four-stroke engine, because this is absolutely crucial to understanding why Ranto's invention was so revolutionary and why everyone thought he was absolutely bonkers for even trying. A four-stroke engine, which is what you have in your car right now unless you're riding a vintage moped, completes its power cycle in four movements of the piston. There's the intake stroke where the fuel and air come in, the compression stroke where everything gets squeezed together, the power stroke where the spark plug ignites everything and creates the explosion that pushes the piston down, and finally the exhaust stroke where all the burnt gases get pushed out. Four strokes, two complete revolutions of the crankshaft, one power pulse per cylinder. Now a two-stroke engine does all of that in just two movements of the piston, one complete revolution of the crankshaft. It combines the intake and compression into one stroke and the power and exhaust into another. This means theoretically you're getting a power pulse every single revolution instead of every other revolution. Sounds amazing, right? More power, simpler design, fewer moving parts. So why doesn't everyone use two-stroke engines? Well, because they come with a whole host of problems that have plagued engineers for over a century. Two-stroke engines are typically lousy at fuel efficiency because the way they're designed, you often end up with fresh fuel getting pushed straight out the exhaust port without ever burning. They're dirty, pumping out clouds of blue smoke because they burn oil mixed with the fuel for lubrication. They're hard to control precisely, they overheat easily, and in larger applications, they're just generally considered more trouble than they're worth. That's why you see them in chainsaws, leaf blowers, and old mopeds, but not in your family sedan. But Ilmari Ranto, sitting in his workshop in Finland in the early 1930s, believed he could solve these problems. More than that, he believed he could solve them in a V8 configuration, creating an engine that would be more powerful, more efficient, and more compact than Ford's celebrated flathead. And you know what? He actually built the thing. This wasn't just a theory or a patent drawing. Ranto constructed a working two-stroke V8 engine that ran, produced power, and by several accounts, worked remarkably well. The Ranto V8 was a fascinating piece of engineering that addressed many of the traditional problems with two-stroke engines through some genuinely clever solutions. The engine displaced about 2.3 liters and used a unique system where the pistons themselves acted as valves, which is common in two-stroke designs, but Ranto implemented this in a way that was particularly well-suited to a V8 configuration. The engine featured ports in the cylinder walls, and as the piston moved up and down, it would cover and uncover these ports at precisely the right moments to control the flow of air, fuel, and exhaust gases. One of Ranto's most innovative features was his approach to scavenging, which is the technical term for getting the exhaust gases out and the fresh charge in. This is the Achilles heel of most two-stroke engines. If you don't get the timing and flow just right, you end up with either residual exhaust gases contaminating your fresh charge, reducing power, 
or you end up with fresh fuel mixture escaping straight out the exhaust, killing your fuel economy and creating pollution. Ranto designed a sophisticated port arrangement that created a specific flow pattern through the cylinders, using the incoming fresh charge to help push out the exhaust gases while minimizing the amount of unburned fuel that escaped. The V8 configuration itself presented unique challenges for a two-stroke design. In a four-stroke V8, you have a carefully orchestrated firing order that keeps the engine balanced and smooth. With Rant's two-stroke V8, he was getting twice as many power pulses, which meant the engine ran incredibly smoothly because there was always at least one cylinder firing at any given moment. The crankshaft could be lighter because it didn't need heavy counterweights to smooth out the power delivery. The whole engine could be more compact because you didn't need all the valvetrain components, camshafts, pushrods, rocker arms, and all that complexity that makes a four-stroke V8 so tall and heavy. Ranto's engine reportedly produced somewhere in the neighborhood of 90 to 100 horsepower, which might not sound like much today, but remember, we're in 1932. Ford's flathead V8 was making 65 horsepower and that was considered phenomenal. So Ranto's engine, at least on paper and in testing, was producing significantly more power from a smaller displacement. The power-to-weight ratio was exceptional because the engine itself was lighter than a comparable four-stroke, and it was making more power per liter of displacement. But here's where the story gets really interesting, and why I started this whole thing by saying this is about the cars that dared to be different rather than the ones that won. Because despite creating what seemed to be a genuinely superior engine in many ways, Ranto's two-stroke V8 never made it to mass production. It never powered millions of cars down highways. Most people have never even heard of it, which is why I'm so excited to share this story with you today. And if you're enjoying this deep dive into automotive history, please hit that subscribe button because we're doing more stories like this. And I promise you, there are so many incredible forgotten chapters of automotive innovation that deserve to be remembered. So what happened? Why didn't Ranto's engine take over the world? Well, there are several factors and they paint a picture of how innovation sometimes isn't enough in the face of economic reality, manufacturing challenges, and just plain bad timing. First, we have to remember the context. It's 1932, the Great Depression is in full swing and the global economy is in shambles. Ford, despite the depression, was an established giant with massive manufacturing capabilities, dealer networks, and brand recognition. They could afford to sell their V8 engines at prices that were barely profitable because they had the scale to make it work. Ranto, working in Finland, didn't have anything close to that infrastructure. To bring his engine to market, he would need to either license the design to an established manufacturer or somehow raise the capital to build his own manufacturing facility. Both options were incredibly difficult in the economic climate of the early 1930s. Manufacturing a complex engine design requires specialized equipment, skilled workers, quality control systems, and a supply chain for parts. Even if Ranto had found investors willing to back his project, the risk was enormous during a time when established companies were failing left and right. There was also the technical challenge of manufacturing consistency. Ranto could build engines by hand in his workshop, carefully fitting and adjusting each component until it ran properly. But mass production requires that every engine, whether it's the first one off the line or the 10,000th, works properly without individual adjustment. Two-stroke engines are particularly sensitive to manufacturing tolerances because the port timing is so critical. If the ports are even slightly off in their positioning, the engine won't scavenge properly and performance suffers dramatically. Ford's four-stroke design was more forgiving of minor manufacturing variations, which meant they could maintain quality even with the manufacturing technology available in the 1930s. Then there's the issue of durability and maintenance. While Ranto's engine worked well in testing, there were legitimate questions about how it would hold up to years of use under varying conditions. Two-stroke engines run hotter than four-strokes because they're firing twice as often. The lubrication system in a two-stroke is different and potentially more problematic for long-term reliability. Ford could point to years of experience with their engine designs and offer customers confidence that their car would last. Ranto was asking people to take a chance on a completely new and untested approach, and in a depression economy, people weren't exactly eager to gamble on experimental technology. The fuel quality of the era also played a role. Gasoline in the 1930s wasn't the refined, consistent product we have today. Octane ratings varied wildly, there were impurities, and the fuel could behave quite differently depending on where you bought it. Four-stroke engines were somewhat more tolerant of these variations. Two-stroke engines with their more sensitive tuning and higher operating temperatures could be more finicky about fuel quality. 
This wasn't an insurmountable problem, but it was another mark against the design in terms of real-world practicality. There's also something to be said about perception and marketing, even though those terms weren't used quite the way we use them today. Ford wasn't just selling an engine, they were selling the Ford brand, the Ford legacy, Henry Ford's vision of putting America on wheels. When you bought a Ford with their V8 engine, you weren't just buying a machine, you were buying into an idea of American ingenuity and industrial might. Ranto's engine for all its technical merits came from a small Nordic country without that cultural cachet. It was weird because it was different and different was risky. But let me tell you what really fascinates me about this story and why I think it's so important to remember engines like Ranto's even though they didn't succeed commercially. This engine represents a moment in history when the future could have gone in a completely different direction. Imagine if circumstances had been just slightly different. Imagine if Ranto had met the right investor or if a forward-thinking company had licensed his design. We might be driving two-stroke cars today. Our entire automotive infrastructure, from the way engines are designed to how mechanics are trained to what emissions systems we use, could have evolved along a completely different path. The technical principles behind Ranto's engine weren't wrong. In fact, if you look at some modern engine designs, you can see echoes of the ideas he was working with. Modern direct injection technology, sophisticated port designs, computer-controlled combustion timing, these are all addressing some of the same challenges Ranto was tackling with his two-stroke V8, just with technology he couldn't have dreamed of. Some modern two-stroke engines, particularly in marine applications and certain experimental automotive applications, have achieved remarkable efficiency and emissions performance by building on the fundamental concepts that inventors like Ranto were exploring nearly a century ago. The Ranto engine also exemplifies something I think we've lost a bit of in the modern automotive industry, the willingness to try something genuinely different, to question fundamental assumptions about how things should work. Today, engines are developed by massive teams using supercomputers and wind tunnels and millions of dollars in testing equipment. Innovation happens in small increments, carefully validated at every step. That's probably smart from a business perspective, but it also means we rarely see the kind of bold, individual innovation that Ranto represented. He looked at what everyone else was doing and said, what if we did it completely differently? That kind of thinking is rare and valuable, even when it doesn't lead to commercial success. It's worth noting that Ranto wasn't the only inventor working on two-stroke automobile engines during this period. The two-stroke versus four-stroke debate had been raging since the earliest days of internal combustion engines, and throughout the 1920s and 1930s, there were various attempts to make two-stroke designs work in automotive applications. Some companies, particularly in Europe, did produce two-stroke cars that sold in reasonable numbers. The DKW brand in Germany, for instance, became fairly successful with small two-stroke engines, and their designs influenced later vehicles like the Trabant that became iconic in East Germany. But none of these designs attempted what Ranto did, a large displacement high-performance V8 configuration. Most two-stroke automotive applications stuck to small, simple engines for economy cars. Ranto was aiming at the performance market, the same market Ford was conquering with their flathead V8. In that sense, he was being even more audacious than most of his contemporaries. He wasn't trying to make a cheap, simple engine for basic transportation. He was trying to beat the Americans at their own game, making a powerful, sophisticated engine that would appeal to people who wanted performance and refinement. The story of Ranto's engine also connects to a larger narrative about technological development and how innovations either succeed or fail. It's easy to assume that the best technology always wins, that the most efficient or most powerful or most advanced solution naturally rises to the top. But history shows us again and again that this isn't how it works. Success depends on timing, on having the right resources at the right moment, on market conditions, on pure luck. The VHS versus Betamax battle, the internal combustion engine versus early electric cars, gasoline versus diesel in passenger vehicles, all of these technological competitions were decided by factors beyond just pure technical merit. Ranto's two-stroke V8 fell victim to these same forces. It was an elegant solution to the problem of making more power from a smaller, lighter engine. But it arrived at a moment when the world wasn't ready for it, when the economic conditions didn't support the risk of adopting new technology, when the manufacturing capabilities needed to produce it at scale didn't exist or weren't accessible to its inventor. It's a reminder that innovation isn't just about having a brilliant idea. It's about having that idea at the right time in the right place with the right resources to bring it to fruition. What eventually happened to Ranto and his engine is a bit unclear, which is unfortunately common with inventors from this era who didn't achieve commercial success. 
Some sources suggest he continued to work on engine designs throughout his career, though never achieving the breakthrough success he sought. The engine itself, or at least examples of it, may still exist in Finnish museums or private collections, though I haven't been able to confirm this with certainty. What is clear is that his work didn't disappear without a trace. It influenced other engineers and engine designers who came after him, even if his name didn't become a household word. The legacy of engines like Ranto's lives on in subtle ways. Every time an engineer questions whether the standard approach is really the best approach, every time someone looks at a solved problem and asks if there might be a better solution, they're channeling the spirit of inventors like Ilmari Ranto. The fact that we're still seeing new engine designs, still experimenting with different configurations and combustion strategies nearly a century after Ranto's V8, suggests that maybe the book on internal combustion engine design isn't quite closed yet. In recent years, there's been renewed interest in two-stroke engine designs, particularly for hybrid applications and range extenders. Modern materials, direct injection technology, and computer control systems can address many of the problems that plagued early two-stroke designs. Companies have developed prototype two-stroke engines that are remarkably clean and efficient, combining the simplicity and high power density of the two-stroke cycle with modern technology that Ranto could only dream of. While these modern designs aren't V8s and aren't trying to compete with traditional automotive engines in the same way, they prove that the fundamental concept Ranto was working with wasn't flawed, it was just ahead of its time. There's something poetic about the idea of a Finnish inventor, working in relative obscurity, creating something that could theoretically compete with the mighty Ford Motor Company. It speaks to the universal human desire to solve problems to make things better to prove that the little guy can compete with the giants. Ranto didn't have a massive factory, he didn't have millions in capital, he didn't have a sales force or a marketing department. What he had was knowledge, skill, determination, and a vision of how things could be better. In the end, that wasn't enough to overcome the practical realities of bringing a complex product to market, but the attempt itself is worth celebrating. This story also makes me think about all the other brilliant innovations that never made it. All the ideas that died in workshops and garages around the world because the timing wasn't right or the resources weren't available. How many potential world-changing inventions have been lost to history because their creators couldn't bridge the gap between prototype and production? How many times has someone built something truly remarkable only to watch it gather dust because they couldn't find backing or because the market wasn't ready? It's a sobering thought, but it's also a reminder that innovation is a collective endeavor. It's not enough to have brilliant individuals. We need systems and structures that can recognize good ideas. Thanks for watching.